We have two wonderful guests that you might remember from last year that did a gardening program with us then. They've also created an incredible in impression on Berwick with creating their food forest in their, at their home. And they've done lots of programming about gardening and food forests, and they are two of the most welcoming people to any ideas and any questions and it's just a pleasure for us to have them here for this four-part gardening series which is incredible and i can't wait to put it to work in our community garden so for any of you that don't know about the berwick community garden it is a garden we grow vegetables in and we donate all those vegetables to the food pantry it's the summersworth berwick food pantry and all of those vegetables go over to help fight food insecurity in this area. And it's a wonderful thing. We did a great garden last year. I think I'll be able to do a better one this year <laughs> with your help. Yep. So without further ado, please welcome Amrita Cottrell and Dennis Jackson. I'll let you give your introductions. But tonight we're going to explore the basic principles of permaculture food and forest gardening. Imagine it, how you can begin to transform your space into a lush, healthy, productive, low-maintenance garden paradise that will last for many years. And we'll start with planting for pollinators. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are very grateful to be here tonight and share a little bit of our experience and knowledge uh, about pollinators. So remember, we're all probably not that far apart in age. Remember when we were kids and we'd go on vacation? We'd all pile in the station wagon and we'd take off. And pretty soon, the windshield was full of bugs. We don't have that happening so much now, do we? No. So this is what we're going to address tonight is what we can do to help um, help our pollinators, help our pollinators to thrive, to survive, how we can um, attract them into our gardens. So that's what we're doing, planting for pollinators. And we're going to talk about why they're so vital for our planet's health. So it's, there's four things that we're going to cover tonight. We're going to discover what pollinators are and what role they play um, in the food we eat every day because they are vital to our food production. We're going to see how pollinators affect our local and global ecosystems and our economies. Wouldn't necessarily think about those little guys helping the economy, but you're going to find out about that. Um, we're going to learn about the threats to pollinators and what we can do as uh, citizen guardians to, um, to help them. And we're going to understand which plants help to support the pollinators. So those are the things we're going to cover in our presentation tonight. There's, I could talk for days on just this subject. So we're going to kind of hit the highlights and we've given you some good um, handouts so you can take notes. And if you have questions, just pop up and ask, and ask them. All right, so here's one of those economic impacts. Oh, a uh, handout. We got to come right oh. here. Sorry, I, I was in charge of that. I'm always looking for a handout. All right, so um, you know, we, we, we find that um, one out of every three bites of food depend on pollinators. Um, so you can see on the on the left the typical grocery store with pollinators and then removing the the plants that require pollination and you see a little difference a little uh, a little more emptiness in the, the display and then what do you do to that, that one you can do the down right yeah and then here in Maine you know Blueberries. 
Blueberries are, are an important crop in Maine and they require pollination. So does alfalfa and clover and apples. Um, in, so Maine um, you know, produces a, a fair amount of agricultural stuff, but like in California, the almond crop is huge multi-million dollar industry, very, very big industry, and that completely depends on pollinators. Um, so here in Maine, we got um, $262 million um, of the crops require some kind of pollination. $12 million um, that comes from wind pollinated plants. And the other $250 billion come from, from plants requiring pollination. And curiously, the largest crop in, uh, in the state is potatoes, and you don't need pollination of any kind for potatoes. <laughs> Makes them a great thing to grow home, at home, huh? <laughs> All right. So there are other animals that uh, really rely on our pollinators and the birds are a big part of that. Lots of birds in the spring, lots of babies and what do the babies eat? Caterpillars. So we need a huge supply of caterpillars in the spring and the summer to feed those baby birds. A single pair of breeding chickadees needs 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to rear one clutch of young. That's an astounding number. If you just think about how many caterpillars you might see in your yard, but a lot of those caterpillars are up in the trees, on the leaves in the trees, and you don't see them. But that's one reason why it's really important to plant trees that, uh, that are hosts to, to butterflies and moths, because there's, that's where the caterpillars are gonna be. And this is um, according to Doug Tallamy, and if you haven't read any of his work, it's really, really good. Um, Nature's Best Home is, is one of his newer books. So what is a pollinator? Pretty simple definition. A pollinator is any animal that transfers pollen from one flower to another. Pretty simple. And what are the pollinators? So here's a lovely list of the different kinds of pollinators. Some of these you might not even realize are pollinators. Hummingbirds, butterflies, bees, of course, wasps, flies, moths, beetles, lacewings, and bats. So two of those are mostly done at night, the moths and the bats. So it's really important in your yard to not have outside lights on at night because it confuses the pollinators. So if you, can, if you have to have an outside light, if you have one that's on a motion detector and it only stays on for a few minutes and then goes off, that's a much better choice. Is there a time? Let's say it's on like from 9 to whatever. Is there a time? Is it better for it to be off in the first part of the, the night or the later part of the night? Or well, we, have, um, we happen to have ca uh, cams, uh, wildlife cams in our yard. Mm -hmm. And um, so if they come on during the night, they, they use a, a ultraviolet, infrared. infrared, infrared light. And we can see the bugs. Mm -hmm. So it could be really any time. I think dusk is a really important time because that's when we see the bats a lot. So, but it can be really any time during the night. And it also means not just the big tall lights, but people just love to put these little pathway lights in their garden. And who, I mean, you don't really need that at night. So um, they're not very practical and they're not helpful to the pollinators, that's for sure. So why? are pollinators so vital in our ecosystem? Dennis is going to talk a little bit about that. All right, so like I said, four. 
Um, one out of three bites of food are produced by a pollinator. Um, and that, um, oh my, my dear, my, I can't see anymore. But um, livestock, uh, um, and, uh, you know, we depend on alfalfa and clover, and those require pollinators. Um, and agriculture, like with uh, apples and cherries and all of that, require um, um, pollination and animals, um, you know, require um, food sources too. And pollinators are, a lot of them are insects. And so birds and other animals that eat insects um, require, require them. But as we saw that there's more than just insects, there's bats and um, and hummingbirds. Um, and then, um, you know, the um, it is, studies have shown that um, oh, um, insect pollinated food contains higher amounts of vitamin E, which are important for us. And then, um, you know, m besides the animals that uh, eat the insects, animals also eat plants. And uh, if the plants don't pollinate, then they also have a problem. You know, there's a lot of things that rely on um, native plants poll getting pollinated and then they eat the, the fruits and, or the seeds of native plants. So that there, there's the um, the ecosystem interlocks in many different ways. And if you try to separate out um, one part, you, you'll see that many parts of the ecosystem starts to collapse. Um, and so, yeah, so that's it for that one. And then Wow, look at all those butterflies in Maine. <laughs> I just want to say one thing about um, pollinators eating insects. A hummingbird, 90% of a hummingbird's diet is insects. We think about them as just being nectar, but a ne the nectar is a very small part of their, their diet. So if you watch closely, if you're sitting in your yard, you'll see the hummingbirds darting around and they're, they're getting insects in there. In that tiny little beak of theirs, um, mostly like mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. So there, we're going to talk about pesticides a little bit later. But there's a really important uh, fact right there that um, if you're using insecticides to get rid of mosquitoes, you're going to really affect your population. So here's a beautiful poster that's available on Etsy. Believe it or not. Um, of the butterflies of Maine. So I went through this and looked, I can't remember now how many I decided that we saw in our garden last year, but it was probably, I'm guessing maybe eight or nine of these. And that was our first year of, in the garden. So uh, we have a lot of butterflies, it's amazing. So here's a little bit about main pollinators. We have 270 species of bees. Now, obviously, we have one European honeybee species. The rest of those are native bees. So they're, they're bumblebees, they're, they're um, hover, uh, hoverflies. I guess hoverflies are actually considered a fly, but um, all carpenter bees all different kinds of bees. Little tiny, tiny bees that you can barely see all the way up to those great big bees, the, the carpenter bees that you see. We have 490 species of butterflies and moths in Maine. 40 species of flies. I, I actually never really appreciated flies until I started thinking of them as pollinators. And I, I enjoy seeing them come to the different plants and, and watching what they do. 176 species of beetle and one 
hummingbird. That's the ruby-throated hummingbird, as you see there. All right, so when you're out in the garden, you have to understand something about insects to understand um, what you're looking at. Because um, insects um, have a lifestyle where at different parts of their lifestyle, their body shape is completely different. And those are called different instars. And then they um, usually go through some kind of metamorphic process and then move into the next instar. So you can see there's three caterpillars up there and three different um, flying insects. And that the one above it, it turns into the, the one below. So three different species. You know, it's like a lady beetle. We're all kind of familiar with the nice red spotted lady beetle, but do you, have you seen uh, the, the lady beetle larva? In your, in your yard, that, that um, black with yellow stripes on it, cruising around. So if you were to go out and go, oh, look at that ugly thing. I'm getting rid of that. You're killing a ladybug instead of um, this ugly thing. So, um, so there's lots of ways you can learn about um, Insects, you can, you know, go online and look at stuff. You can get big books like this. This is um, Garden Insects of North America. This was put by, together by an ex a university extension service and focuses on um, insects that people are likely to see in their garden. Um, but there are lots of different um, books and websites that'll tell you about insects and how they have their different lifestyles. And so it's an important resource to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. So the milkweed tussock moth is the only other um, insect that only eats milkweed. I had never seen one before. I'd actually never heard of one until last year. A friend of ours um, who lives on, over on Long Swamp Road has lots of milkweed. And of course, we were just building our garden at the time. She said, what, come over and, and dig some milkweed. So we did. And we get home. And I go, I'm out in the garden and I see this thing. And I'm like, what is that clown looking thing? So I went and looked it up and found out what it was. And I think the moth is really beautiful as well. So I, I'm sure that this year we will have some of those in our yard. Well, I, I don't know about that particular thing, but but there are 200 species of lady beetle. Okay. Who knew, right? Yeah. <laughs> They're popular. So, there's one very dominant in old houses. <laughs> Could be. Kind of comes in with the stink bugs, I think. Oh, okay. oh my goodness, the stink bugs. So let's talk about threats to the pollinators because there, there are many and we're not helping so much and we've been getting better at not helping so much. So we can turn that around. So one of the big ones is the increasing loss of habitat um, with all of the urbanization that's going on, um, old farms that have been taken over and made into developments. Um, those sorts of things are, are just taking over the habitat of these various pollinators. The increased use of pesticides in residence, res residential use and commercial use um, is just devastating our population. Residential, unfortunately, is without any knowledge. You know, people just go, oh, I don't like that, I don't want that, and they go to Home Depot or Ace or someplace, Agway, and they just pull something off the shelf and they don't even realize how devastating it can be to our pollinators. Often, too, 
they don't read the label about how to use it. So that's a really, really big problem. Commercial use is, is even bigger. Um, the expanding climate change is affecting um, the, our seasons and the migration of the pollinators, especially the um, monarchs. I mean, that's one that everybody pretty much knows about, is that the monarchs have really been in dire straits for a number of years now. And speaking of monarchs, um, the rising incidence of diseases. So the varroa mites is an issue of the honeybee, the European honeybee. And OE is, um, is a virus that affects the monarchs. So a lot of the monarchs can live to maturity, but then they, they, can't, they can't migrate. They have this disease. So when, I, when we were living in Oregon, and I was raising monarchs, we had to test for OE and see if they had it. And as I said before, the excessive use of, of lighting, outdoor lighting, is really um, affecting our nighttime pollinators. It d disorients them. They, they just don't know what to do because they're not used to so much light at night. All right, so pollinators are like us. They need shelter, they need food, they need water. And so it's important to recognize the, um, that, you know, like the slide showing that nice little water dish, so like insects can land on the rocks in, the, in this little water dish and drink. Um, or another way of providing insects water is to, to have a wet spot or a puddle uh, so that they can get down and just they, just, they don't need a lot. Like a lot of butterflies don't drink out of open water, they drink out of wet soil. You'll see right at the edge of a, of a puddle, the, the butterfly will land and drink um, out of the saturated soil so that they can stand, they don't, you know, sink. Um, and so as part of an, having adequate habitat for um, pollinators, it's important to make sure that there's water sources around your yard. Um, and you also want to um, make sure they have plenty of good food. And you know, for m most pollinators, that's uh, some kind of flower, the nectar on. Um, and m some pollinators will, because they're insects, they go through different lifestyles. So having the plants that are appropriate for that insect. Some insects only eat specific plants like milkweed um, supports um, monarch butterflies because the caterpillars, they, that's all they eat, is just the milkweed. And so there's several types of um, insects that eat just a single plant. Some of them eat two or three different kinds of plants. So if you don't know um, what kind of plant, there's, there's lots of resources. And in fact, um, we've got a, a wonderful uh, document that we can email to you or at least a link to you, to you that, that shows the real um, different um, um, insects and what they need, right? Yeah, so this is put out by the University of Maine. It says, it's called Habitats, a fact sheet series on managing lands for wildlife. And it deals mostly with butterflies, all the different butterf not all of the different butterflies, but many of the different butterfly species in Maine. And it tells, you know, what, what's their habitat, what is their larval food plant, and what does the adult need. So one of the important things to remember about creating, uh, providing food is that you need to plant your plants, your pollinator plants, to start from the very beginning of the season, which hopefully is coming soon. Um, so when the bees start to emerge, 
what do we see? Dandelions. Dandelions is a great food source for bees. So don't get rid of your dandelions. Don't mow them. Don't, don't pick them for dandelion wine, not just yet. Um, the, the, the bees really need them. Um, and then you need to plant all the way through until and through the frost. So there's, there are different plants. And I believe that this, this document also has in the back, I think the last page, one of the last pages tells you, um, yeah, here it is. It tells you what blooms when. So if you want to pick a couple from each category so that you have something blooming all the time. Okay. Another important thing, going back to what insects need to eat, is a lot of insects, you know, like I said before, are tied to one or two or three uh, different types of plants. And those are often native plants. And so it's important to plant uh, a good variety of native plants around your yard so that there's food for these pollinators. Um, and if it's possible, one could um, shoot for having 70% native plants and 30% of other plants. But, you know, what you, you got, you know, your yard maybe, maybe um, is has the mix of plants that it has, and it takes a while to shift. So, so it's just something you can work towards. And it's also important to um, look at what kind of practices that you're doing in your garden and see if you can change them so that you support uh, pollinators. Like, one thing that's not useful for pollinators is cleaning up all the leaves at the end of the season and, and bagging them up and sending them off to the landfill or, or to the, the compost um, place. Um, because there's a lot of insects that plant their eggs in the leaves and then they'll overwinter and come out in, in the spring. Um, Because that's where ticks hide out for the winter, too. Well, you know, you got to balance out off um, what's going on, you know, so. Turkeys and opossums. Yeah. That's all you need. <laughs> They'll take yeah. care of them. Yeah. They love to eat them. Yeah. And it, um, in, in California, there's even a lizard that um, the, when a tick bites the lizard, the, the, the lizard blood ends up um, uh, absorbing the, um, the diseases that uh, ticks have. Oh. And, and so there's a lot fewer um, tick-borne diseases delivered because of the, the presence of a lizard. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll go back to the pollinators. Um, you know, so, and it's also really important to reduce the stress on the pollinators. So like one of them, like Amrita's mentioned before, is the lighting at night. So there's like moths um, are really important pollinator. We don't think about them too much because they do their action when we're not in the garden. Um, and pesticides, um, own, you know, we try to refrain from using any kind of pesticide. Um, even organically approved uh, pesticides um, have their um, ramifications out in the garden. So trying to be as careful about the use of um, pesticides is important. Um, and just um, Know, making sure that you're careful, uh, like that you're, um, if you're going to, if you see some damage on your plants, well, how much damage can you accept without really taking strong action? Um, and what's damaging it? Is it a pollinator or is it 
some other type of insect, and that's where it's important to be able to identify what you're looking at. Or a bunny rabbit. Or Could be a bunny. Yeah, it's true. They, they eat leaves, don't they? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, um, you know, another thing like with the leaves, it, it can provide a place for insects to nest. Um, and like we mentioned, the water. So, and maybe the most important practice is educating yourself about all the different insects that you might see in your yard. Okay. Okay, so now we get to the garden design, which is the fun part. Um, you want to make sure that when you're designing your garden, that you design it with the pollinators in mind, because really they should be the most important part of your garden. So you want to plant a diverse mix of native plants, as I said before, and ones that bloom throughout the seasons, because that'll keep your pollinators there in the garden. If they have plenty to eat, they're not going to be going elsewhere. Or they might go to your neighbors on either side, but they're not going to go that far. And this may be something you don't know. Bees like certain things. They like white, blue, purple, and yellow flowers. They don't really care so much about the shape because I've seen, and you probably have too, seen bees go down into snapdragons and then blink back out. It's very cute. Butterflies need open flat flowers like yarrow, um, zinnias. They love zinnias. Um, they like verbena bonariensis. Nice flat flowers where they can sit down. But hummingbirds and hummingbird moths, they don't sit down. They they hover, and they need something where they can put their proboscis inside. So they like tubular, and they like things that are orange and red and violet and pink. And planting, like my grandmother lived in Holland for a while when I was a child, and she talked about how in Holland they plant in drifts of color. So. That really works very well for pollinators, too. Let me tell you a story. Um, last year, this, when the, um, I think it was the zucchinis, and maybe it was the um, patty pan squash first started coming out, I wasn't getting any germination. So I called a friend of mine who lives in Oregon, and I said, Robin, what, how, what's going on with my squash? She said, oh, you're not getting pollination. She said, Plant an anise hyssop right in the middle of your squash because the bees absolutely love anise hyssop. And she said, they'll come right in and they'll pollinate. And I did that and it worked beautifully. So what, what we tend to do is plant um, the pollinator plants down through the middle of the vegetables. So some people like to grow in, in rows. We do forest for food forest gardening, which is a very different concept. It's where you plant most of things together, all kinds of different things together. So you don't, you don't go in with a rototiller and dig it all up. You don't have straight rows. Things, things are planted in groupings. The other good thing about that is that um, if you happen to have a problem with a pest, and you've planted things in groupings around your garden, you might have the pest over here, and it might take out a pepper plant or a squash or something. And if you've got it in two or three other places, it's unlikely that you're going to have the same problem there. So diversity is a really good, a good thing. So if you plant your, your pollinator plants down the center of your garden, it brings your pollinators in to do the work they need to do with your vegetables. So here's some lists and they're on your, your um, handout as well. And these are just sort of the things that I've done that I know work. So obviously you don't have to, you don't have to plant all of those. Um, but it's a list that you can refer to. 
So if you plant mostly perennials, you're going to have your flowers year after year after year. Some of these grow from seed. Um, and I went out last year and saved so many seeds. I, our kitchen table is just completely covered with seeds right now. We don't even eat at it. But um, so if you plant mostly perennials, then I like to plant some annuals. Now most of these perennials, let me go back, are, um, these are native. Most of them are native. So if you plant mostly perennials that are mostly native plants, you've got, you're well on your way to doing your 70%, right? Native that, to New England? Or to New England. <coughs> and then I like to fill in with some of our favorite annuals. You know, there's, there's just some favorites that, they may not be native, but they're favorites. Like, I never loved zinnias so much as I do now, after last year. They were monarch and fritillary magnets. We had so many butterflies in our yard. Borage, which is what this picture is, is, a, is another favorite. And the bees absolutely love borage. Um, Cosmos, yeah, they're beautiful. Cleome, I grew Cleome for the first time last year, and I love it. Sunflowers, of course. Um, and alyssum, sweet alyssum. It's a, it's a very low, I'm sure you know what it is, it, it's a very low growing um, ground cover and so sweet, the smell of alyssum, I just love. And the little tiny, the little tiny bees and the hoverflies love alyssum. So remember to plant for the moths. And these are plants that the moths love. This is a hummingbird moth which I, I love to watch them. And these are the plants that they like. Um, and again, it's because they, they can get their proboscis down into that, that sort of trumpet shape. And most of these are actually not native. I think the primrose maybe to Maine. And then don't forget the herbs. Right? Herbs are a really important pollinator plant and they're so easy to grow. They take care of themselves. Um, and all of these that I listed here are pollinator magnets. The dill and the fennel um, are hosts for the swallowtails. So I plant, I plant the fennel, I planted it last year hoping that we would get some, some caterpillars from the swallowtails, but we didn't. But we we'll keep, keep trying. All right, so grow straight species, not a cultivar or a nativar. So a straight species is another way of just saying a, a native plant, one that hasn't been um, modified in any way. So uh, a cultivar is a, the, the result of a breeding program, whether it's a traditional pre breeding or whether it's uh, even genetic engineering. It's a plant that um, has been selected for specific characteristics and carefully manipulated by people. And everybody wants their, because they're so pretty. Yeah. But they don't work very well for the yeah. pollinators. And then uh, nativar is a native plant that has been taken and um, subjected to plant breeding techniques also. And one of the problems with nativars and cultivars is that the plant can be sterile. Um, like a lot of... Um, Crosses just result in maybe the production of a fruit, but the seeds inside the fruit you can't um, grow and grow the plant out. It's you know it's the, the hybrid process. So um, mm -hmm. using nativars instead of actual native plants 
um, will be an eventual problem. It will be starting to cut off the food supply for uh, insects that depend on that plant. Um, so, you know, like I mentioned before that um, larval, um, the larval stage of an insect is often tied to just a small number of plants. So just keeping that in mind and, um, and that, you know, we have a tendency of getting like really showy, like, like roses are an example that there's these modern, relatively modern roses that uh, flowers are so complex and, and tight that pollinators can't really get in to the flower parts of the plant. You know, so, um, so it's in, important to just keep in mind the importance of native plants but not use native ours. So when we say plant, we're not just talking about perennial flowers or annual flowers. We're talking about trees and shrubs. And many of the trees are larval hosts. So an oak tree, I don't have the statistics here, but an oak tree um, is host to several hundred types of butterflies. I mean, that's amazing when you think about just one kind of tree can, can take care of that many different kinds of butterflies. Um, birch, hackberry, dogwood, ash, poplar, cherry, um, oak, sumac, willow, common lilac, and elm are some of the trees and shrubs that are hosts to to pollinators. So when you're thinking about things that you're going to be planting, don't, don't neglect the trees and the shrubs because those are really important to the overall health of the pollinators. So here's some information on um, what to look for when you're buying plants. Um, one of the things that I'm in the process of doing, and I was hoping to get it done for today, but I didn't, but I can send it out to you uh, with these other things, is I'm putting together a list of local nurseries who don't use neonicotinoids. And that's really important. Those are the places that you want to support. Not the big box stores, sorry. Um, so choose native species. We talked about that before. As much as possible, choose a native species. Um, buy organic plants and seeds, because seeds are treated with neonicotinoids. What, what are neonic? Okay, what we're going to talk about that. Dennis is going to explain that. We have a whole slide about neonics. Um, they're really nasty, really nasty. Um, grow your own plants if you can. One of the things that I'm doing this year that I've never done before because I've never lived in an area that had winters like this is, um, well, I shouldn't say never, never in the last 50 years, right? Um, is I'm doing winter sowing, which is where you take uh, gallon jugs, like water jugs or milk jugs, and you make a little greenhouse out of them. I have like 30 some, three dozen or so, lined up along our fence that I have things planted in. And it creates this wonderful little greenhouse. It just sits there and waits. And when the weather is perfect, they germinate, they grow up, you transplant them. It's like no fuss, no muss. So we'll see how well that does. But you can grow your own plants. I mean, you can also go in, invest a whole lot and start things, you know, with grow lights and all that, but it's not necessary. You don't have to do that. So as I said before, ask for plants that don't have neonicotinoids or other insecticides and shop at nurseries that only practice pollinator-friendly pest management. So Dennis is going to talk a little bit about what neonicotinoids, otherwise known as neonics, are and how dangerous they are. Yeah.
Okay. So, neonicotinoids are neurotoxins. Uh, they're, in, they're more or less modern um, insecticides that have replaced like organophosphates um, and another class of um, insecticides back in the 1990s. Okay. And they're really cheap to produce. And so a lot of um, agricultural operations will um, employ neonicotinoids as a preventative. They don't even wait to see if they have an outbreak because they're so cheap, they just spray them. Or the seed companies um, treat the seeds with neonicotinoid. Um, and there's three or four different types that they use. And it's just a pretreatment to you know, help the seeds survive any attack from in the soil. But um, the, the, like the, on a big, large commercial scale, um, seeds are planted with seed drills. And the process of doing that creates a dust of neonicotinoids that float out and they can get around the machine and, and, and even drift off the, the plot that's being um, seeded. Neonicotinoids are generally thought to be harmless for mammals, but you know, there's always maybe room for more study on that and they're targeted for insects, but they're not specific. They don't, they don't go after a type of insect. They go just any kind of insect and they um, destroy the nervous system of the insect. Okay. And only about 5% of the applied neonic actually goes into the plant. And it's a systemic um, pesticide, meaning that if you put on a foliar spray, you can still find neonics in the flowers or the fruit, or even in the roots, because it goes to the whole plant. Once it's absorbed by the plant, it goes into every cell in the plant. Um, and there's studies showing that it, um, neonicotinoids are showing up in water supplies. Um, and they're persistent in the soil. I read about one study today that they looked at, an, at different um, citrus orchards, so one-year-old, 10-year-old, and 20-year-old, and have been consistently managed using neonics. And they can see a progressive buildup of neonicotinoids in the soil over the 20 year period. So, um, you know, so like a lot of big nurseries use the seeds that have been treated with neonicotinoids, and some of them even apply the other neonicotinoids to the foliage of the plant. And usually you bring that home and you um, put it out in the garden and um, insects that come and eat it will um, suffer from that. Um, so, you know, like the slide gives you a little bit more information about binding to the near cells and, um, and what it does to the insect. And then it is possible for a single seed that's been treated with neonicotinoid to kill a songbird. So it's, um, it's one of those little big problems that are kind of in the background. Okay. What are, some what are some of the examples? Yeah, what, what are the names? Oh, they're complicated chemical names. I didn't no, write them down. No, 
like? Is it in uh, Miracle Grow? Is it in uh, Is it in uh, Scotts? Is it in Is it in what? Who Who's Who's putting them in in there? Um, the the, I think they tend to be more um, commercial. Uh, I'm familiar with the actual names of the different nicotinoid chemicals themselves and not the products. But, um, it's the plants that, that you're buying at the nursery that have been treated. So that's why I said it's really important to yeah. only support nurseries that don't use neonics. And people are becoming more aware of it and asking. And so nurseries are tending to be a little more conscious of that now. But not everybody. Yeah. And I don't necessarily trust when um, certain big box stores for marketing purposes say, oh, we don't use them. So I'm not sure that's true. Yes. I can't say for sure, but I kind of doubt it. Maybe they don't use them, but their supplier But their supplier does, does or the right. seeds have been, They're yeah. Seeds. Right, and, and with a big box store, um, this week we're buying a lot from these guys, and we know all about them, and they're really good. They have a production problem, so suddenly you just switch over to this one, and oh, you didn't ask about whether they treated with neonics, and they do. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, this is the fun part, I think, of, of gardening for the pollinators, is become a pollinator guardian. I mean, see yourself as this, like, I love this little, this little cartoon of me, um, see yourself as sort of a superhero in your garden, right? I'm here to protect you, and here's the things I'm going to do to protect you. Stop using pesticides on your lawn and your garden. Think about maybe getting rid of your lawn or reducing the size of your lawn, but don't have a company come in and do all the stuff that they do to your lawn because they're using chemicals for the most part. Maybe not all of them, but. Buy local plants that are organically grown. Reduce your area of mowed lawn, like I said. Use natural mulches and compost. And, but you don't want to do everything. You don't want to cover every bare area that you have with compost because, as I said, we have 200 and some native bees. Many of those bees are ground nesting bees. If they can't get to the ground, they can't nest. If they can't nest, they're not going to be in your yard. So leave some edges, leave some places maybe towards the back, towards a fence or something where you don't put, put that down. <laughs> Reduce and remove invasive exotic species. Who knows of one? <laughs> burning, bush. burning bush is one, definitely. There's a vine. Bittersweet. 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 Oh. If you see bittersweet, it's even taken over my poison ivy. go after it. <laughs> go after it. It is one of the worst invasive exotic species in Maine. Nothing works, though. No. Well, I mean, I don't use you have, just have to keep at it. I just cut. Yeah, pull, it cutting, pull it up. You pull it up, cut it. Pull it out and pull out, like I did with the poison ivy. You have to pull out and try to get the roots. Yep. That's the only way. Eventually, you'll you'll get it to the point where it gets weaker and weaker and it won't come back as much, but it's terrible. It's constant. Pardon? Um, I've not had any luck with that though. Vinegar will do some things, but these really strong exotic species, they won't do. Yeah, they do. They just go everywhere. Uh huh. Um, and it goes all the way across the yard. Yeah. Yeah. And you wake up the next morning and feel like you've been resting. <laughs> <laughs> but then all that, you know, you just get all filled in and then and leave it with the roots. Okay, so even talking about that, go one step farther. Don't plant invasive species. Here's a list. This is a list in Maine of do not plant. So. And some of them are things we really love. Honeysuckle. Oh, we love honeysuckle. We love barberry. Do you have a copy of that? It's going to be sent to you. If you've signed up on the list, I'll send you this because it's a PDF. Yeah. 
Um, but there's things that people planted years ago, like yellow iris, yellow Japanese iris. They have become terribly invasive in our waterways because they like wet feet. And what do we have around here? <laughs> Lots of wet area, right? Provide water for wildlife, not just for the pollinators, but for everything. So get some little um, flat dishes and things and just put them around your yard and keep them, keep them fresh. So, you know, clean them, clean them out. Don't let them get all scummy. But all the water, all the wildlife needs water. And leave some wild areas back against the, the, the edges. Leave some things wild. Pile up some brush so that, you know, toads and frogs and possums and things have a place to, to thrive. And make gardening fun for everyone. Think about when you're doing your garden, who could come and enjoy your garden? Get the kids out there. Make it a family project. Um, if you can make it accessible for people with disabilities, um, if you can plant up higher so that people don't have to bend over, I'm one of those, um, it's, it, it invites people to extend the period of time that they can garden. And that's one of the things, as people get older, they don't garden as much because it's too hard to do it the way they've always done it. So if you can make raised beds that aren't just like, you know, raised that much, but that are up at this level so they don't even have to bend. It really, um, and it doesn't have to be a lot, just one nice little area that, that they can get the fingers down in there. Come on, let's get growing. <laughs> hmm? It's the back. He's flying away, he said, come on, let's go. <laughs> so I'll open it up for questions if there are questions. Yeah. I've been gone for about 42 years. I've lived in New Mexico. Mm. Mm. Uh, and uh, the growing season is so different compared to here. Mm -hmm. I'm learning a whole new, I just moved back and I'm currently living in Berwick Meadows and uh, uh, I've had quite a few years experience with the gardening in the southwest. Now I'm learning a lot of what uh, the do's and don'ts uh, here in the state of Maine. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, <coughs> the seniors at Berwick Meadows are ecstatic. I've introduced the workshops on the power of mulching. Good. And now uh, the interest of having raised beds and grow bags mm -hmm. uh, it seems to have uh, found a, a mark on the, uh, the people there. So uh, it's an enthusiastic crowd in Good. terms of dealing with that. And it's really, I'm glad, I'm glad I came to that because I'm going to bring this uh, workshop uh, to the land. Understand the importance of uh, pollinating. Mm -hmm. that, that sort of thing. It's amazing. Last year, every, practically I would say three fourths of the residents there had gardens. Oh, and uh, they were wow. sharing the bountiful uh, crops uh, in the community room. So it became mm. a, a kind of like a fruit market. Wonderful. <laughs> That's so great. So, it's so been great. Fun. It's been fun. Wonderful. Yes. What about Thank you. Uh, uh, the insects that attack what you're growing, um, like we have all kinds of apple trees. Not a single apple does not have a mark that an insect has been in it. Or when I was, uh, when my poor grapes were doing well, you'd open up a grape and there was an insect in it. Mm -hmm. You know, last year, and, and certainly the fungus is, a, is an issue as well in this area. But what do you do? You don't have a crop. You know, luckily, it was the first year, well, actually, it was the second year for my peach trees, and they did okay. But mm -hmm. I'm sure by next year, they're going to be full of insects, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know. It is, it is an issue. Um, I would... The apple trees that I've had, and I was hoping by now, I would have had some good crops. I had a whole mm -hmm. bunch of them. 
mm -hmm. oh, all scribbled and all with all burrowing holes and everything. They mm -hmm. were awful. I couldn't use them for applesauce. Oh, so sorry. We're just getting started with fruit, so I don't have experience with that. But you could call the extension yeah, service. Call the extension service. Yeah. Yeah. Tell you when to put them. And now, now is the now time. Using, well, oil, but yeah. Well, now is the time to do that and to do the pruning. Dennis just did a pruning uh, workshop. Uh, took took it. He didn't give it. <laughs> so besides the the dormant oil spray is having a diverse garden landscape so that you bring in predators to the insects that are um, attacking your, your fruit trees. Um, so do bats help? Because we put up a bat house. Well, could be. Uh, um, that's where you need to, to educate yourself, to, to do some research and find out, I know, exactly what the predators might be for whatever it is that's attacking. I don't know what that is, but um, yeah. that would be the way. And and with the with the food forest gardening, you you have all these different things growing together, and you have your trees in various places rather than just in an orchard, yeah, they're all right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I would call the uh, extension service. Yes. I have a lot of white moth, mm -hmm. and they eat my plants. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll tell you what I, what I did last year, what we did last year. Um, those are cabbage moths, and they make the little green worms, you know, that like to eat everything. So I basically, around all of the plants, the brassicas and things that they like to eat, the cabbages and the Brussels sprouts and all of those things, I planted around all the plants, I planted marigolds, different kinds of marigolds. And... <coughs> I did not have the issue until the frost. When the marigolds died, then they took over. Really? But during the summer, we didn't have an issue. I so I put, because um, I usually put them around my tomatoes. Uh -huh. um, but I still, you know, they invade. The, yeah, cabbage, the, the cabbage moth. moth. So the other thing you could do is you could use some floating row cover, is what I would suggest. If it's really a problem, just get floating row cover and put that over top of your, uh, your plants. Yeah. And then they can't, you know, they can't get in there and lay the eggs. I have to say, though, I put in the ground in my lawn, um, and I have a good garden every year. The, stuff that you buy at Home Depot and it kills like a thousand bugs. I have too many bugs in my yard that I could not go without mm. um, putting something down. And I have a lot of birds, so it's still, I have to have something, mm. you know, to kill the bugs. There's just too many. I have a lot of woods behind me. So, I mean, it just... I think if you do some research on techniques, I think you'll find that there are other ways rather than using any kind of pesticides. Last year I had, I had so many bees that I couldn't sit out in the yard unless I had um, Dawn and uh, vinegar and water and sprayed. They were landing on you? They, my my daughter, granddaughter and myself, we got stung one day. It uh, probably was not a bee. It was probably a wasp. Bees seldom sting unless you are actively um, trying to get to them or do something to them. They're, they're really passive. Uh, honeybees. So it's probably a wasp. So can you, like, uh, so I had a lot of um, bee nests, and uh -huh. they were in her toys. Uh -huh. I should go pick up a toy, and all uh -huh. of a sudden, you know, bees are flying out. So, so is there any way to prevent them from... Them from Don't leave the toys out. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one thing. Yeah. Put, the toys in a, put the toys in a tote. You know, or someplace, yeah. because they like cavities. That's the way they, that's the way they nest. So, and they're probably drawn to the colors. Who knows? But yeah. could be. Yeah. But I just encourage you to to do some, do some research rather than just going for the stuff that you need to spray, because that's that's what's causing the collapse. We have an insect apocalypse right now. And that's been well, well written. 
about. New York Times had an article probably five years ago about the insect apocalypse. That's why we don't have them. I don't know if you were here when I first started talking, but um, that's why we don't, when we're driving around, we don't have as many bugs on our windshields as we used to. Okay, I don't want to, we're already past time, so I don't want to keep you. Um, any other quick questions? Did everyone sign the, um, the mailing list that was going around on a clipboard? If you want to receive these other handouts, um, sign up on that list and then I'll send them to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I am looking for volunteers who would like to help out with the community garden too. If anyone's interested in that, they can just call the library and get to me.